Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 8th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what the true opportunity costs are of PFD cuts. Second, we explain why assuming state revenues from oil follow oil production volumes is wrong. And third, we explain why KTUU's recent man on the street question about the PFD is misleading. And now let's join Michael. Let's get started. We're gonna talk about the weekly top three uh, which are, of course, the big three stories that Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets feels like, um, you know, is important to us. So first things first, Brad, the opportunity costs of the PFD. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means, right? This guy, some of these people, oof, man, it's pretty horrific stuff. Give it to us. Let's get started. Well, Michael, you accuse me at times of, of engaging in Twitter debates and Facebook debates and <laughs> a- accurately so. Yeah. Uh, and I got in one of those and it it made me realize something that I've known, I've talked about on the show, but sort of sort of re-impressed on me what's what's happened over the last, oh gosh, seven years uh, since we got into the since we got into the PFD debate. Um, and that is the what are the opportunity costs of the PFD? Now, by opportunity costs, economists usually mean the alternative, what would you use, what would happen in, in the absence, if you didn't do X, what would you do instead? And what's the cost of that, of doing it that way compared to the way you're doing it? Like a uh, lost opportunity cost. Like right. you had a lot, because you had to do one thing, you had the lost opportunity, you couldn't do something else kind of thing, right? Much better stated than I was doing. Yes, exactly. And 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 so sometimes people will talk about the opportunity costs of the permanent fund dividend. And that has really, what they're talking about has really changed in the last seven years. In this particular debate, or in this particular Twitter exchange, what the person who used the term meant was the opportunity cost is, oh, if we didn't pay, if we didn't distribute money as PFDs, what would we use the money for instead and the usual argument, oh, we would use it for K through 12, we'd use it for the university, we'd use it for capital, the capital budget to build infrastructure. And all of those things would produce better returns, the claim is, all of those things would produce better returns than distributing the, the PFD as PFD to put it in the pockets of, uh, of Alaska families. That's not where this debate started. And, and that's not where this term started. Back in 1960, 2016, uh, back in 2016, when ICER did the study of what were the alternatives to the PFD, they viewed op- opportunity costs as, as alternative revenue measures. If we didn't raise money through PFD cuts, how would we raise money? We would raise it through a, prop- a statewide property tax, through a statewide sales tax, through a statewide income tax, other revenue measures that would produce the same revenue to the state as as PFD do PFDs do 
And in all of those cases, ICER found that the return to the state, the, the economic impact of the state was lower than distributing the money as PFDs. If, if, you, if you did PFD cuts, you would, the state would suffer a certain, a certain level of economic harm. If you took money out through these other tax approaches, the state would suffer a certain level of economic harm. And the economic harm of PFD cuts was worse than the economic harm of the alternatives. That was the opportunity cost uh, of PFD cuts. Along the way, that story got changed. And it got changed into uh, uh, arguing that the opportunity costs of PF, it got changed into arguing about the opportunity costs of PFDs. If we didn't distribute the money as PFDs, what if we distributed it as what if we used it for K through 12? What if we used it for the university? What if we used for what if we used it for uh, capital budget to, to build additional infrastructure? The reason that are the reason that argument got changed is because, in my opinion, the those who who were going to have to ante up, those who were going to have to pay. The, the alternative revenues from PFD cuts saw where this was going, saw where that argument went, and that it would be that they would have to bear a share of the cost, not all of the costs, but a share of the costs of paying for K through 12, the university, uh, the capital budget, uh, and, and those sorts of things. And they saw that they were going to have to pay a share, for, share of it. In the alternative, if we if we raise the money through PFD cuts, they didn't have to pay. They they would bear a trivial the the, the top twenty percent would bear a trivial share of the costs uh, of if if we did it through uh, if we raise the money through PFD cuts, they would bear a little bit more but not a whole lot more uh, a share of the costs if we did it through sales taxes, and they would bear more uh, uh, more but not any more than anybody else if you used apply tax. They would bear more uh, through an income tax. And the oil companies saw it the same way. If the money was raised through PFD cuts, then they weren't going to have to contribute because there was enough in the PFD that you could cut it. You could cut it deeply, as we've done. You could cut it deeply, fund, close the budget gap, and oil companies wouldn't be looked to for to bear any of the dish additional costs uh, of spending that we were on track to do. Non-resident industries, the tourism industry, uh, the fish industry, both of whom are very heavily dependent on non-residents and would likely have to increase their, their salaries to the non-residents if there were a tax that touched non-residents. The non-resident industry saw the same thing, that if we raised it through PFD cuts, if we raised that revenue through PFD cuts, they wouldn't have to contribute to the costs uh, of, of, of the additional spending uh, that, the, that the state was doing they could get off, as Hammond termed it, scot-free uh, by not having to, to, to pay any share of the cost. Non-residents would pay zero share of the additional costs. So, so in the course of, of the debate from 2016 to the present, in the course of the debate, the, the use of the term opportunity costs shifted. The opportunities we were talking about, the alternatives we were talking about, shifted from what ICER focused on in 2016, being the alternative revenue uh, options, uh, shifted to, oh, what if we just spent this money instead on K through 12? Ooh, that'd produce a much better economic, economic return. We wouldn't have to pay for it. We, the, the top 20%, the oil industry and non-resident industries, wouldn't have to pay for any of it. Uh, we would be fine. Um, we would shift all the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families by using PFD cuts. So as you as you follow through the discussion from 2016 to the present, the term opportunity cost has shifted. The meaning of the term opportunity cost has shifted from alternative revenues, uh, ways to raise alternative revenues to, to fund this spending, to the spending itself. That if we cut PFDs, then we get to spend all this money, and that is a, that has a a better oppor that that's a higher opportunity benefit uh, than distributing it uh, by PFDs. It just really, I mean, this this whole exchange brought home the 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 intentional 
changing in the in the in the definition of the term opportunity right. opportunity costs from from the beginning of this debate in 2016 to where we are in 2024 and everybody's been guilty of it legislators right. been guilty legislators have been guilty of it media has been guilty of it it's 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 been controlling the definition of the term control controlling the rhetoric that has resulted in uh, in this shift in the debate We've talked a lot about capturing the language, uh, you know, the shifting of definitions throughout, uh, you know, throughout the last 15 or 20 years, uh, you know, it, they've become very good at it. People and special interests have become very good at it uh, in, in taking a specific word that we think means one thing and, and shifting it into something else. Um, and and I think that, uh, you know, that is a big part of it. You know, what's interesting here is they never address the opportunity cost. And I read through the, the Twitter exchange and I've, uh, I've seen a lot of this before. But what really stuck out to me was they never talked about the opportunity cost for the private sector. Like what happened if you pulled a, a, if paid a full PFD and that money was used in entrepreneurship in starting a business and creating jobs and creating wealth for other people. They never, they always talk about, and this again shows the difference in this state between not necessarily Democrat and Republican, but between government, big government folks and smaller government folks or pro government versus pro private sector. However you want to label uh, us out here in the world, but essentially that's the thing. When they say opportunity cost, they're only talking about government spend. They're completely ignoring the private sector because I know that, you know, you're going to talk about, oh, people are going to take the PFD and go do hookers and blow or go to Hawaii or buy big screen TV. They never talk about the people who gather their money together as a family over a year or two and then launch, you know, a 50, 60, 80, hundred thousand dollar business that then generates revenue then generates taxes, then creates and hires job, you know, creates jobs and hires people and does all that kind of stuff. They never talk about those lost opportunity costs. And that that's what was captured in the in the uh, in the ICER study, in, mostly uh, in the ICER study. What what the opportunity cost is when you look at it on a on a on a revenue basis, when you look at PFD cuts as a revenue source and compare them to other revenue sources, what you figure out is the marginal spend of those who would pay the tax, the non-resident industries, the, 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 the oil companies, the top 20%, that marginal spend is largely out of state. Uh, they spend the money, that marginal money, that marginal amount of, re of, of income that they otherwise would, that they otherwise would pay in taxes, that, that the top of their spending category is otherwise largely in investments or other things, vacations, otherwise being spent out of state. And what you see is the PFD tends to be spent in state. There are those, you know, occasional stories of the guy took the vacation to the to Hawaii. That's largely the top twenty percent that's using the money to take right, the vacation right. to Hawaii. It's not. It's not you. It's not others that are listening to this program who you know pay their property taxes or do something else you know, buy fuel for the winter or, you know, buy something, a, a needed home repair. That's not, they're not talking about the bulk. They're going to these, these marginal stories about, you know, the top 20% took a vacation to Hawaii. Well, yeah, but, but, but they could have, if they'd paid taxes, then they might not have stayed at the top tier resort in Hawaii. They still would have taken the vacation to Hawaii, but not, not taking the top tier resort to Hawaii, but they still would have gone, the top 20% still would have gone to Hawaii. So it's 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 you're really trying to analyze which has which approach has the bigger impact on the industry or on the state. Certainly those people who are claiming, well, we could distribute the PFDs as K through 12. They're all arguing that spending it on K through 12 or spending it on the university or spending it on the capital budget for additional infrastructure. All that would have positive benefits to the state. But right. there's a better alternative to all of that, which is to raise the money equitably across all Alaska families and reduce the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families, those who spend most of their money in the state. That's the thing that kills me is that they continually focus so hard on what more the government should have that they never focus on what the effect on the economy is in the private sector. We're so fundamentally divorced between those two economies that it doesn't even it doesn't even dawn on them. What could be done with that money by people out in the private sector? 
Um, I mean, I never went to Hawaii on a PFD. I never went to, you know, I don't, I don't even think I ever really made a major purchase except for, I remember the one year that Palin, uh, included the, the, the heating thing and all that stuff that did help me pay off my balloon payment on my mortgage. I had a balloon payment. I had a second on my mortgage from the owners, original owners, and I paid it all off in one year, uh, using a big chunk of that. But other than that, that's all I ever, I mean, otherwise it was just, like you said, tires, heating oil, clothes for school, you know, or clothes for the kids and, and new school books and, and whatever it is. I mean, just regular everyday stuff. They act like it's a, a gift or a bonus kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's themselves they're talking about, oh, you know, somebody would just spend the PFD on going to Hawaii. Well, that's the top 20% that spends it on, on, on going to Hawaii. It, you know, they talk about some people that, you know, buy snow machines with it. Well, you know, out in the bush, a snow machine is a necessary vehicle. So that's not a bad thing. If we're talking about somebody in town who's buying it, who's, who's you, you know, who's buying a machine, machine, snow machine with it, that's more likely the top 20% than it is somebody who's paying rents or, or paying their mortgage uh, in, uh, in Anchorage or, or in Fairbanks. It's, it, it, it's capturing, I mean, this whole debate just brought home to me again that people are trying to, people have successfully, those who are trying to dodge paying their proportionate share of the cost of government have successfully captured the language and have restructured this all and have restructured the debate in terms of, oh, we could be spending it on K through 12 or, oh, we could be spending it on the university or, oh, we could be spending it on, on capital improvements. Well, the real alternative as ICER looked at it in 2016 was, oh, well, we could be raising that money that you want to spend on K through 12 in a much more equitable fashion that had a much lower adverse impact on the on the Alaska economy right. than through PFD cuts. We could be raising right. it through equitable uh, taxes of some sort. If that's what you want to spend it on. The other thing about that, the other reason they've captured that debate and turned it is because, as, as Scott Kendall admitted at one point a few a few months ago, if we had to talk about taxes to raise that money through taxes, as opposed to capturing it through PFDs, people wouldn't, people would reject or would rebel at spending it on some of the things we're spending it on. Yeah. Exactly. If the, if the top 20% had to contribute toward the costs of these things in the same way as they're, as they're pushing it down to middle and lower income Alaska families, the top 20% would say, no, no, keep that money in our hands. We know how to spend it better than spending it on those things. So by capturing the language and shifting it to shifting it to you know the burden on on the remaining 80 percent the other 80 percent the top 20 percent have not only been able to dodge spending they've been able to keep spending uh because they know that they wouldn't be able to spend it they, because they wouldn't be able to raise the money right if they had to do it through through taxes uh, Brian asked the question, isn't money fungible? Generally, it doesn't matter in the, in, where the money is spent in the economy. I mean, that, that discounts the time value and the, and the multiplication factor of money in the private sector versus in the hands of government. We know that, that money in government hands turns one time in the economy versus between six and seven times in the private hands. So it's fungible to a degree, but again, it's the return in the long run, right? I mean, that's the, that's the. Yep. I, I, that's, I, I ICER did those calculations as part of the as part of the 2016 study, and they said money was better off in the hands of the private sector in the in the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families than than being bled out uh, in the fashion that uh, uh, through through the other uh, means of yeah. raising money. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. The weekly top three continues. Number two, number two. This is the feeling from. Uh, oil revenues. Some people just don't seem to understand oil revenues in terms of, well, much of anything, including oil production. Brad, give me the uh, give me the, give me the deal here. Well, Tim Bradner had an article in the Frontiersman that that I think is just misleading. Here was the headline of it. It was a few days ago. North Slope oil production dropped sharply in June, but new projects will soon ease decline. And Bradner went on to talk about how good it was that that these new projects were coming on and was going to was going to increase oil production. And here's sort of the key sentence that 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 triggered me as I was as I was reading through it. Production data is watched closely because state royalty and tax revenues 
are paid on the basis of oil produced. And basically, the the theme of the of the of the column was, or the theme of the story was, don't worry about it. Oil production's in decline, but we got these new these new uh, projects coming on. They're going to increase oil production, and implicitly, they're going to increase revenues uh, to the state from the increased oil production. That's not true. This the 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 spring revenue forecast that. Um, uh, uh, Department of Revenue puts out, Tax Division of Depart Department of Revenue puts out, breaks out sources of income uh, by category and has and it has as one of those sources of income, petroleum revenues. And it talks about, uh, you know, it, it gives the forecast of what the petroleum revenues are going to be. It shows, it shows, it also shows production uh, volumes and it shows production volumes going up at a, at a, at a fantastic rate, like a, a, a compound annual growth rate of 4% uh, per year, just climbing and climbing and climbing from the various um, uh, projects that Tim Bradner is talking about in his column. But here's what it says about revenues. Revenues start at 2.2 billion. They go down from that. They go to 2.01 in FY26, 2 billion in FY27, and they continue going down they stay below the FY25 number of 2.2 billion. They stay below that number through FY32 for seven years through FY32, stay below, even as production volumes are climbing, stay below that revenue number through FY32 and only sort of get back to even in, uh, in FY33 compared to a production growth of of, of 4% plus per year, the compound annual growth rate of revenues, just when you compare FY25, the beginning of the period, and FY33, the end of the period, uh, the compound annual growth rate of, of revenues is 0.4%. What's going on? What's going on is, is two things. One, the, the growth in production is occurring both on state lands and on federal lands. And on federal lands, the state gets none of the royalty revenue. The royalty revenue is split 50% to the federal government and 50% to certain state projects not benefiting the state, benefiting communities on the North Slope, 50% to, to, to those projects on the, on the North Slope or wherever the oil is. It's not going to the state. So when Tim says, oh, for production growth, revenue growth, that's not that's not true with respect to the, the with respect to the portion of the revenue growth that's coming from federal lands. It's also not true on the tax side. On the tax side, you, the, the top line number looks like it's tied to uh, uh, volumes. An increased volume at a certain price means an increased tax. But what that doesn't take into account is all of the sort of subcategories that bleed into bleed into our tax system, our petroleum tax system that really gives heavy weight to investment. If you're investing, you get to deduct that investment from the capital investment you're making. You get to deduct that from your tax obligation um, all in one year. It's not even amortized over a period of time, all in one year. And so even if you're having production growth, if that production growth is being driven by investment growth, that investment growth is, is, is being deducted from the tax revenues and it's driving tax revenues down. So, so volume growth, I mean, you hear candidates on the trail say, oh, hang on, we'll be fine. Uh, the production volumes are going to grow. Revenues are going to go up. We're going to be fine. Yes, we're going through a period right now that, you know, where we have deficits, but just hang on. You know, I've helped contribute to this production growth and the production growth is going to dig us out of it. It's not happening. It's right. not happening. Well, but Bradner's Bradner's a pretty sharp guy. I mean, you know, I've read his stuff. I've been reading his stuff for a long time. He's a pretty sharp guy. He should know this. He should know better than this, looking at this, looking at the reports. What's the scoop here behind the scenes, Brad? Why is he hype, hype, raw, rawing on something that's, you know, in five years he'll go, oh, well, it's not as good. I mean, what's the what's the deal? Tim is is a very good journalist. Tim is very smart. Tim is also pro oil. And if you and if you if you admit to what's going on with the revenue side that the revenue side is disconnected from the production side, 
the concern in the oil industry is that people will say, wait a second, we're, we should be getting a share of these additional of this additional production. All of the benefit of the additional production shouldn't be going to the industry. A portion of it should be shared with, with individuals. And that would be an impetus to go look at oil taxes and say, what's going on here that, that revenues aren't going up in the same way that oil production volumes are? So the industry tries to hide that fact. The industry goes out of its way to, to leave the impression that production increases result in revenue increases. But the Department of Revenue, even Adam Crumb's Department of Revenue, doesn't lie about this. The projections that they're showing clearly show that even with the huge production increases that are that that are being projected over the next 10 years, that that revenues are staying below current revenues for seven of the eight years or, or nine of eight of the nine years that the revenue forecast looks at. Revenues are staying below current revenues for eight of the nine years and only in the ninth year. Do they creep up to sort of the level where we where we started at? Industry doesn't want you to rec industry doesn't want you to focus on that because it will lead people like we've talked about on the show. It will lead people to say, "Wait, <clears throat> there, there may be something wrong with the oil tax system here." If that's, right. if that's what's going on. Well, exactly. And you, I mean, you've talked about. It. I mean, you're an oil and gas guy. People who think, "Oh, he's in the bag," but you've said there's four or five hundred million dollars on the table there that could be picked up and taken and should be. Uh, to help, you know, uh, equalize what's going on and whether that's in, uh, you know, amortizing those investment credits out or doing, I mean, there's plenty of different ways to do this so that everybody shares, you know, shares the wealth and shares the pain in that regard. Yeah, exactly right. And the other, and the other thing, industry, I mean, from industry standpoint, they're paying royalties regardless, right? They don't really care if they're paying it to the state or pay, paying it to the feds. Whoever gets, I mean, the industry is not going to get the benefit of the royalties. The, they're they're going to go one way or the other. They don't focus on the fact that it's going more to the feds from the from the federal lands. It's going to the feds uh, instead of the state. And they don't focus on the impact that has on state revenues. They just say, look, we're paying royalties. I mean, we're not, we're not trying to short anybody royalties. We're paying them. But from the state's standpoint, and particularly from, from the PFD standpoint, which is taking the hit of all this, guess who's filling in the gap that oil revenues aren't uh, during this during this prolonged period? From, from the PFD standpoint, it's the PFD that's taking the hit from those royalties going to the, to the feds. There are ways to restructure this that are fair to the industry uh, and are fair to, to Alaskans uh, and ways to address this situation that are that are fair to both, but we're not we're we're not doing it. What, what do you see as being the ways to do that? We've got three minutes left of this segment. What do you see as the ways to do that to equitably change it so that they pay their fair share, that they pay, you know, that, that you know that that everything equalizes? What what do you see as being the fix to that? Top three: well, close the Hillcorp loophole, which is a hundred million dollar plus drain a year on the state budget by, by giving Hillcorp advantages that are not given other, other companies. Uh, two is to address the per barrel credits, although that doesn't do, people think it does a lot more than it does, uh, but to address the per barrel credits, even the Dunleavy administration a few years ago when they came up with alternative revenues said that we could cut the, the per barrel credits uh, roughly to, in half to $4 a barrel without affecting production volumes, which is the real test here. Can we do things from a financial side that don't affect production volumes? And the and the and even the uh, uh, Dunleavy administration said, yes, we can cut per, per barrel credits. And then the third thing is to address this investment, the way, the way investments dealt with. Originally, you, we, the, the, the statute was set up to treat investment as something that we really needed, really wanted, really had to have a lot of because we were we were on a downslide with respect to production volumes. And so they set up the the, the tax system to, to allow the deduction of investment uh, in the year in which it occurred, all of it in the year in which it occurred. They also, there's a concept called ring fencing that gets involved in that as well. Um, and it, it, ring fencing is you invest someplace else, you get to deduct it, deduct it against all of your taxes as opposed to just in that in that other location. 
we can we can address investment the the deductibility of investment and address investment in a way that still encourages the industry to invest, but does it in a way that's not as as hugely impactful on revenues um, as the way uh, as the way it occurs now. So that so that when we see production go up, we would see some kind of at least commensurate increase in uh, in oil revenues as it came through, yes. whether that's spreading it out or forcing them to take the credits in the areas in which they're investing them instead of across the board. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There are way, I, and that's those are the three big things: close the Hillcorp loophole. Uh, address the per barrel credits and address the way in which investment uh, is uh, is is amortized or not or in the case of where we are now, not amortized, not so, amortized out over a period of time. I'm all for giving the oil companies incentives to continue to stay here and to invest. But at the same time, everybody's got to eat. You know what I mean? Everybody's got to eat. I never understood this idea of you could take oil tax credits or you could take investment credits. You could invest anywhere and then take them against you know, this other field or what and I'm just like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, it should be in the areas, it should be ringed again to the area that we you making the investment for future investments or future royalties. It shouldn't be, you can invest all this money into something and take it from everywhere else. To me, that never made sense, but you know. Well, it's, it, I, it, 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 in a way it's the way that the federal income tax works, right? I mean, you can, you, you produce profits from making widgets. A corporation produces profits from major, making widgets in Massachusetts, but it's building a new plant or a costly new plant in California. And that plant isn't that it, that plant isn't producing the same profits, but you still can use, you still can use the, the costs from that and because you file a, a, a single return, you still can use the costs from that plant against the, against the costs, against the profits that you're reaping from the, from the plant you have uh, in Massachusetts. It, it was built on that sort of that same logic uh, that that a corporation, a single entity corporation, is entitled to, you know, weigh up its profits from some places and weigh up its its well, investments and losses from other places. That's a similar. It's a similar situation, but it's not exact. And the fact is, that we're not building widgets. We're extracting a we're extracting a uh, a single resource that is a limited resource, right? I mean, it's, it's, you could never go, you can't just make more widgets. You can't just make more oil. It's a, it's a limited resource. And so that's, to me, that's, that's the main difference in that. And that's why we should be talking about it. There, there's, there's different ways to address the investment piece of how you calculate taxes. Ring fencing is one of them. Um, uh, amortizing, requiring an amortization of the investments over a period of time, as opposed to letting them all go in the in the front uh, front end loading the, the the investment deduction that's another way of addressing it. The point is, I think that that we've gotten out of whack since since SB since the tax bill was passed in 2013. We've gotten out of whack between the the reality on the ground of the oil industry and what the tax structure is. That tax structure was built at the time to renew investment to regain investment in Alaska. We were losing, Alaska as a, it was losing investment to other jurisdictions, partly as a result of, of ACES. Well, in significant part because of ACES. There was a diversion of investment to other places. So the restructuring of the, of, of the oil taxes at the time was, let's get investment headed back to Alaska. Let's build that investment that will build production volumes and get us back on track. And it's accomplished that. The problem is now that we're now that we're what ten years down the road from from that, it's time to tweak. It's time to go in and look at that tax structure and say, okay, this is what it led to. This is where it's leading. That isn't exactly where we wanted it to go. There should be a fair share of revenues, but of of the benefit of the revenues between the industry and the state, and and we don't see that showing up. The, the Department of Revenue forecast is showing us that volumes are rapidly growing and revenues from the petroleum industry are declining and then sort of sneak back up and get uh, get even by the end of the by the end of the, the forecast period. So that's not where that's not where it needs to be. We need to go in and relook at the component parts um, to do that. And and we should be going in and relooking at the component parts. But things like Tim Bradner's article that leaves the impression of, oh, happy days, production volumes are rising. We're all going to benefit from that. That's not what's going on, folks. 
Yeah. And, and, and spreading that propaganda, that industry propaganda is leading to people saying, Oh no, well, we can't go address all taxes. Cause we, we, you know, we'd mess in our, mess in our own bucket because, you know, we'd, we'd lose revenues. Well, we're losing revenues anyway. Right. And, right. and, and we ought to go in and readdress the share. Um, I want, I don't think we have enough time. I did want to talk a little bit about the Chevron, uh, thing. Uh, maybe we can save that for right after the show, because I think that's an important component. You've seen all the oil, all the lawsuits that have been filed in the last week after the courts uh, uh, killed the Chevron defense. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a very interesting time, especially for NPRA and a lot of these other places where the agencies have been given all this deferential treatment by the courts. Um, so maybe think about that as we come back out into, uh, into the, into the final segment. Cause I know that you probably have some experience in that area, uh, with how they're acting on that. So we'll continue there. Brad Keithley, the weekly top three continues. The third of the weekly top three subjects for this truth Tuesday is the man on the street thoughts on the PFD. Alaska's news source, KTUU did a man on the street interview about this. And Brad, my only comment on this whole thing is damn people are stupid. That was, I mean, <laughs> it's the first thing I thought of as I watched this and I watched this clip about three or four times. And I was like, damn, you people are stupid. You have no idea what you're, you just have no concept of what this is about, but I'll leave it to you to uh, give us the details of this. Go ahead. With that lead in. Um, so yeah. So Alaska news source, KTUU did a uh, sent a reporter out um, uh, on the street to, to ask people a question about the PFD. And the, the background of this is at the end of the budget cycle, uh, the legislature announced a, that they'd come to an agreement that, that they claimed resulted in a certain PFD amount. When Governor Dunleavy signed the budget, uh, they had recalculated the amount and uh, and the amount that Governor Dunleavy uh, said was going to be the PFD amount is higher uh, than uh, the uh, than what the legislature uh, said. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that happens. The difference, the numbers are about a hundred dollars apart. It's not that big a deal. But the reason why that happened is is two, three things. One is um, the uh, uh, revenues that the state's getting the, the revenues that are going to the to the supplemental portion of the P, portion of the PFD the energy rebate portion of the of the PFD the revenues came in a little bit higher for the state and so that that increased the revenues that are that are going out in PFD that was that was probably the smallest of the three things the second thing is, are things that only the administration will know one is what are the administrative costs that are deducted the way the PFD is calculated is the PFD division gets a certain amount of revenues appropriated by the legislature, and then the PFD division deducts certain, makes certain deductions, uh, uh, well, certain additions and deductions from that number uh, to calculate the amount of revenues that will be distributed. The the deductions appear to be lower than what the department than what the legislature had assumed when they gave their number out. And the other thing is is the number of of people who are authorized to receive a PFD. Uh, that number is also known only to the administration. It's the divisor. It's what you calculate. It's what you divide the total revenues by. The, the lower the number, the bigger the per unit PFD, the higher the number, the smaller the per unit PFD. And, and it appears that that the number of applicants uh, accepted by the, by the Department of Revenue or Permanent Fund Division uh, this year is going to be lower than what the legislature had assumed. And that ups the number of the PFD a little bit. But in any event, the, the administration had went out with a with a number of what the PFD was going to be. And so KTUU sends a sends a reporter out on the streets and says and asks people, what what's your reaction to a seventeen hundred seventeen one thousand seven hundred and eighteen dollar PFD? What's your reaction to that? No context behind it, just the PFD is going to be 718. What's your reaction to that? And they get this range of reactions by, you know, people who say, oh, it's too much. Uh, we ought to be, you know, spending more on government as opposed to spending it on the PFD. Going back to our first segment, they buy into the they buy into the change in the language that's occurred over the last seven years. Um, some say it's about right 
uh, because I, you know, I can use that, that PFD to, you know, pay for fuel or I can do it to pay for increased rent costs or I can pay it for, you know, the interest rate hike on my mortgage. Uh, uh, I can use it to offset, offset those costs. And, um, and, and, you know, and that's sort of the, the range of reactions they get from too much to, to just right. But what if, what if KTUU had gone out and asked the question a different way? What if they'd said, all right, the PFD cuts about $2,000. <laughs> the, 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 what they're going to pay you is $1,700 and, and the estimated, um, uh, 19, uh, 2025 PFD, if we use the statutory formula, is roughly $3,600. So $1,900. That the PFD has been cut by $1,900, 2000 to round it about. What do you think about cutting the PFD by $2,000 and diverting that money, not to government, but diverting that money to let the oil companies and the and the top 20% and the non, and non-resident industries get off with not having to contribute, contributing only a trivial share? Uh, in the case, what, what do you think about that? The reaction they would have gotten would have been much different than the reaction when you go out and say, "What do you think about seventeen hundred dollars as your PFD?" Right, right. The the what what the news industry, Alaska's news source is what KTU calls itself now. What what the news industry is doing is buying into the rhetoric, buying into the storyline that the top twenty percent non resident industries and the oil industry industries want Alaskans to buy into and say, aren't you lucky that you get $1,700? What do you think about that amount? Aren't we good for having given that to you without putting it in the context of the statute says it would have been 30, it would have been $2,000 more. What do you think about, what do you think about the fact it was cut and diverted to the benefit of those other groups? Answers, the answers would have been much different. So what we're seeing is, is this, this change in rhetoric, this change in discussion from, from where we were in 2016 when ICER did its analysis in 2017 when we started this debate, we're seeing the impact of the change in, in the rhetoric that's gone on over the last seven years. And now we're just you know asking people, what do you think about getting what, what do you think about getting $1,700? It's not right. being put in a context that allows them to fully understand what's going on. Well, the the most blatant thing to me was that these people just didn't understand what the PFT is or how it works. That was the first informer that just struck me right out of the gate. And you're right; how you ask the question is is very is very telling on what answers you're going to get. If you had said the statutory PFT is supposed to be about thirty seven hundred dollars, you're going to get seventeen hundred. What are your thoughts on that? That's that would have been a better kind of more neutral question instead of just this amorphous it's 1700 bucks what do you think um but it was very obvious that people just have no idea what the pfd is about that it is in fact their money their fair share of the oil revenue as residents and that the people i mean if they took the time to explain that look we put the money in the account and then we split the money and the government already gets 50 percent, and now they're taking 75 of your 50 percent, you know if they explained all that there'd be a little more outrage but nobody explains that nobody we we talk about it on the program here all the time but no other major news outlet is laying it out and saying here's where it is here's what they get already here's what they're taking now here's what the pfd would have been here's what you get now what do you think nobody and says that, yeah and that starts with the government right i mean mike dunleavy pfd defender mike dunleavy could have easily said that could have easily said the statutory amount is thirty seven hundred dollars but i'm only going to pay you seventeen hundred dollars because that's all the legis all your legislators appropriated if you want to if you want to go complain to somebody go complain to your legislators because that's what they voted for dunleavy could have set the rhetoric rhetoric could have set up the understanding of the PFD, but he didn't do it. He's not done it since since twenty since twenty nineteen. He just he says you know he's just he just adopts what the legislative rhetoric is, which is yep, what you're going to get seventeen hundred dollars. Aren't you lucky? Uh, and 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 goes with that. Legislators, I mean, even candidates out there. I very rarely hear candidates talk about the statute provides that you get thirty seven hundred dollars. Your legislator, your incumbent, only voted to pay you only seventeen hundred of that, and divert the rest to shielding 
the top 20% non-residents in the oil industry from having to pay their share uh, of the of the cost of government. They've pushed all the cost of government off on on you. I don't. I very rarely hear even candidates talking about that anymore. Um, so it's the, the rhetoric from all the way from opportunity costs, which we talked about in the first segment, to the amount of the PFD, which we're talking about now. The rhetoric has just shifted over that period of time, being driven by legislators, being driven by the oil companies, non-resident industries, and in the top 20%, being driven in a way to, to, to ignore the tax effect, the, 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 the adverse effect uh, of, the, uh, of the cut on Alaska families and on the overall uh, Alaska economy being driven in a way that benefits them and and works to the disadvantage of the other 80% right. of Alaska families and works to the disadvantage of the overall Alaska economy. With the mainstream media being a main accomplice of all this kind of stuff, because the, the media is not digging into any of this. None of the articles or, you know, none of the, it's only opinion pieces that touch on this sometimes, barely at all. But none of the mainstream reporters are digging into this and asking questions and saying, well, wait, you're supposed to get 50. They take 50. Now they're taking 75 of the 50. I mean, it's uh, it's a it's a whole thing. But again, they're they're being supported uh, uh, by the by the mainstream media in this narrative. And they've just bought it hook, hook, line and sinker. We got 90 seconds. Well, exactly right, Michael. And, and here's the deal. I think people ought to be when they talk about the PFD, they ought to be talking about, look, the PFD this year, the statutory PFD is thirty seven hundred dollars. We're only getting. $1,700. Why is that? It's because the legislature has decided to cut it and divert the benefit of it over to top 20% non-residents and, uh, and, the, and the oil industry. That's the fact of what's going on. And, and candidates ought to talk about that. The governor ought to talk about that. That is the, that is the fact of, of what's happening uh, with, the, with the statute that, uh, that, that has that is still on the books, never been yeah. amended, never been changed. Kyle Johnson, uh, Kyle Johansson, uh, former legislator, says the PFD statute does not trump constitutional appropriation power of the legislators. Well, only because it's now being treated as if it's revenue. I mean, that was the that was the ma the major sin that Walker committed is instead of being a simple transfer and payout. It then they they changed how they accounted for it, so then it became government revenue. So then it became subject to appropriation, right? I mean, before that, it was a simple shall transfer kind of thing, and uh, it was never accounted as revenue, and so they just let it. It just went on through. That was the major change there. But the bottom line is the statute still remains on the books. So yeah, now we now we got yeah. dueling statutes. Yeah, well, no, we don't have dueling statutes. I, my reaction was that it, my reaction to that is usually yeah, so. I mean, we've got a statute on the books. Legislators tell us that we ought to follow the statutes. Legislators, you know, go out and, and preach about following the law. The statute's still on the books. Yeah, the legislators can cut it. They can enact taxes, which is essentially what they've done by cutting the PFD, but the statute's still on the books. And, you know, the fact the legislators can do it, can enact these taxes, okay, fine. They're doing it against the statute that's still on the books that provides for a, for a higher amount. So, okay. Yeah, they can do it. Yeah. I don't, I don't disagree that they, that they can do it. Should they do it? Is it in the interest of Alaska families? Is it in the interest of Alaska economies, the Alaska overall economy for them to do it? Nope. That's what the ICER analysis in 2016 showed us. There are better ways to raise that revenue. Should they do it? No. And, and, and the fact that they can do it is sort of irrelevant to me. Right. I mean, it's constitutional. We're not saying that they don't have the power of appropriation, but the question is, should you? Uh, or, I mean, you know, again, I think that was the other thing is that if there's a law in the books, you don't just ignore the law. You don't just ignore it and say, well, well, you know, you change it. That's where the power of the legislature is. They can't be bound by previous legislatures. They can't be bound. Then they change it. So, I mean, it, that's that's what gets me. Um, all right. Quick thoughts on um, the Chevron, decision yeah. by the Supreme Court on Chevron. Uh, this is going to have some wide reaching ramifications, I mean, across the country. Uh, but specifically oil and gas, we've already seen 
Of course, uh, what, four or five lawsuits now have been filed over NPRA and the North Slope. Conoco's got one. The North Slope's got one. There's another uh, a native uh, group that's got that's got a, a state's filed one. There's all kinds of things. What are your thoughts quickly here on the Chevron uh, death of the Chevron deference? Well, I, it's going to be different from other people. I, I, I think it's a bad thing. And the reason I think it's a bad thing is that we've now sh- we haven't taken away the interpretation of statutes. We've still got ambiguous statutes, but we've now shifted it from, from agencies with expertise down to judges without expertise. And what we're going to have for, for a long period of time, I'm afraid, is a lot of judges who are going to rule in different ways that this statute, because they've now, the, the Supreme Court's now moved that decision-making authority down to the judges. We're going to have some judges who say the statute means X. We're going to have other judges who, who say the statute means Y. Judges who don't have expertise in the area are going to be making these decisions. And we've just rock, we've just increased the Supreme Court, the, the appellate courts and the Supreme Court's load by some exponential factor because they're going to have to resolve all these different decisions that are going to be made by different judges about what a given ambiguous statute means. It's, it's not it's not removed power from the federal government. It's shifted that power from agencies down to judges who are not experts um, uh, in the area. I The way to address the problem with, with, with overreach by federal agencies is is to change the agencies, change them by statute, change them by presidential administration, change them by who you confirm to go on the agencies, the policies those those people follow. It's not to fragment, to, in my opinion, it's not to fragment the 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 interpretation of these statutes or the application of these statutes among however many judges we've got uh, throughout the United States. And I th- I think it's going to create chaos. For a long period of time. Yes, there may be an occasional situation where an agency said X and a judge in Alaska, uh, although jo- not Josh Kindred anymore, but a judge in Alaska is going to say why. Um, and yes, maybe, you know, in that situation, we're going to be better off because the judge temporarily better off because the judge in Alaska said why. But that's going to be appealed up to the Ninth Circuit. Then it's going to be appealed to the Supreme Court. And and we don't know what they're going to say that that, that statute. Right. Means. So. We're going to have a period of chaos. Well, I mean, look, I, I'm going to disagree with you on this for a specific reason. Maybe not in the terms of oil and gas and everything else, but I think Frank pretty much trips right over the main problem here, which is uh, agencies with expertise or agencies with agendas. And that's what we've seen uh, in a variety of industries, and especially, for example, the firearms industry with the ATF just deciding that, that you know, arbitrarily interpreting rules that have been interpreted one way for years and now arbitrarily, that's just a prime example of it. But that's, this is this all falls back to Congress. Congress has a responsibility to get the expertise when they craft the laws and to craft specific laws instead of these ambiguous frameworks and then allowing bureaucracies, unelected, unaccountable bureaucracies, to then fill in the blanks and write those laws inside and the regulations inside. That's the main problem because there are agencies with agendas. That's the, there's, there's no two ways about it. There are agencies with agendas. And if we allow the agencies to make all those decisions, it's going to be a problem. You got 30 seconds here, Brad. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, the agencies I've dealt with in, in my career did have expertise and did, I didn't always agree with the outcome but at least it was uniform throughout the nation. Trying to trying to devolve this down to however many judges we've got out there, how many district court judges we've got out there is going to be chaos. And we're going to have inconsistent decisions. And it's, it's going to sort of depend on what judge you pick at what point in time, what decision you're going to get. It'll be interesting to watch, that's for sure. May we live in interesting times. Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on board. Thanks for joining us today. Michael, as always, uh, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.